So now we can open it up for questions. And we do have a few questions. We have Linda Horowitz asking about voter suppression. You guys want to take that? You want me to take it? What is she asking? <laughs> she says, uh, can you address voter suppression? It was very open-ended. <laughs> well, well, I, just, I just say, you know, because the session ended abruptly, a lot of those bills died, which was an advantage. Yeah, that, that was helpful. Um, Pat mentioned, if you haven't yet signed the Invest in Ed petition, please find one to sign. Um, I think they were mailing them out to people, actually, if they needed, so the households could sign them, and then you can mail them back. So please consider that. Um, yeah, I would say on the on the voter suppression thing, uh, the Democrats, uh, the you know, the House Democrats and the Senate Democrats are putting together our ideas for what we would do in a special session. And we are talking about uh, particularly uh, vote by mail and getting people on the on the pebble. Uh, but like uh, Dr. Fries said, most of the, the, well, I think all of the bad voter suppression bills in 2020 died. Uh, thank you, COVID virus, uh, you know, <laughs> did have some good, some positive death, right? <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, what else do we have? So Pat Mesh is asking about, um, if there could be care options for the children at school. Uh, I think, in fact, I was really hoping that uh, Layla Counts would be on the call tonight because I was going to put her on the spot for some of this. But I know that uh, some of the schools have had, you know, like preschools in the school. The schools are still doing uh, lunches uh, for the kids. I mean, they're, they're filling in a lot of gaps that are not necessarily related to education, but you know, they're, uh, they're trying. And I'm, I really appreciate what the, the, everybody in the education field is doing. I just, um, I saw that there was a question from um, Paula regarding the housing. Um, she wanted to know who's the agency in Pima County um, for housing assistance. So the community action agency here is called the Pima County Community Service Agency. Um, so I, I would look under housing in the Pima County website which I think is Pima.gov, but I'm not sure. Um, I think the problem is though at both ends on this. It's, it's, it's at the state level and it's at the county level. You see, initially the, the document, documentation that was, was uh, requested to apply for the rental assistance was, was really unnecessarily burdensome. An applicant had to submit bank statements and proof of income for two months prior to March 30th, and they had to submit information for any other adult household member. The, the other issue is that the community action agencies, although they are experienced in helping Arizonans through tough times, they're also in pretty unchartered territory right now. There aren't um, they are not huge entities, they're small, and they don't have a large workforce. So if, if uh, we recall correctly, um, by the way, the, the governor did not mention anything about housing assistance or eviction prevention measures in his um, press conference yesterday. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I don't know what, and I don't know anything more than that on, on the, the housing assistance piece. Okay, we have a question from Rex Scott, and I'm going to unmute him so he can speak for himself. Hey, Rex. Okay, Rex. Hey, thank you all for um, outstanding and informative presentations. Um, Victoria, I had a question about uh, chokehold bans. Uh, oftentimes, uh, even uh, departments or uh, departments or, or, or cities or, or counties that ban chokeholds still say that they're allowed in instances of deadly force. Uh, for example, if you look at the Pima County Sheriff, uh, their policy is that chokeholds are, quote, generally prohibited, unquote, uh, but are only allowed uh, during instances where deadly force is, is justified. Uh, but I have read that oftentimes uh, officers and, and, and their unions will use deadly force justifications uh, to um, get around chokehold bans. So I just wondered uh, how you thought that could be addressed appropriately. I think that, that the justification of existing rules, existing laws, is, is uh, that's the problem. 
And so that's one of those things that's going to depend on how strictly, how, how narrowly legislation is written. I think it's going to have to be a, a legislative thing. I know Congress is trying to do this, but to get something through Congress, you've heard the it's going to take an act of Congress to do that. Well, an act of Congress takes a really long time. We move faster but not fast enough because we're trying to get the governor to bring us back into special session to deal with all of these very important, especially the, the school related things related to COVID-19. But we're also trying to get the governor to call us in to work on police reforms. I don't see that happening. Republicans tend to not, um, like the things we're talking about. So um, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm, I'm sort of expecting that this next session, the Democrats will be in power in at least one or both chambers of the legislature. And um, if not in both, then in the Senate, if we're close, but not the majority, um, I think that we, we have more power than we've had in years past because there are two or three Republicans that, that tend to vote with us um, on some really important things. So I think that we're going to see more changes in this next session. Do I think we're going to be addressing chokeholds and everything before then? Probably not. We've asked, but um, the governor's response was um, he appreciates our ideas. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I see that uh, Mary Strauss has a question about um, hiring practices. And so the the um, the Democrats have come up with, I think it's like five, five different bills. And a lot of it was touched on with uh, what uh, Senator Steele talked about. But uh, in those bills that have been passed, they have been proposed in the past, but never heard because they were proposed by Democrats. Uh, there is uh, a proposal that there should be a, a database of of law enforcement officers basically and that there should be a mandate that if somebody's applying for a new job in another police force that they look up his record in the old one now the the um laws on the books actually wipe out their behavior records every two years and so now you don't necessarily know that you've hired somebody with bad behavior in the past until they do something again so it's a very bad system so that is in our proposals that there would be a um a uh a database of the of the law enforcement that could be uh you know it could be a lookup and a reference tool um there was another question can i say something pam yeah. mm -hmm. um, while you're you're looking at the other questions um and i don't want to take up too much time on it but i i think one of the things we're seeing is um we're watching our beautiful mountains here and the catalinas go up in flames <laughs> and um Yes, these were caused by lightning and, and they're, they're really hard to fight. And today the town of Oracle is being evacuated and the fire just keeps growing. It's like last I heard it was 30,000 acres and but 44% containment. So we're getting there. Um, it's still frightening. And I think what we're going to find is that our um, Saworos are really more in danger than ever before, um, particularly with buffalo grass. So maybe we can, you know, we're, uh, the last I heard was that this fire fighting effort just in the Big Horn fire has been about around um, $10 million to fight and we're not done. So the, the cost of, of manpower or human power, um, the cost of water, and the chemicals and, and the, the loss of our, uh, we have a lot of things to, to look at, but this just brings home the reality of climate change and how extremely important it is to us as lawmakers because we have a hotter, drier future. This is our reality now. We have less water and, and, and hotter, drier temperatures. So we have to do a lot of things. So seeing more fires, not surprising. Um, seeing um, the, the use of our water and, and, and the disappearance of our groundwater in particular, very sad. 
and and a reality that we have to really look at and and we're going to have to make some tough decisions i also want to say very briefly and we're not going to have time to get into it today but with the cost of these fires and we're not the only community in arizona that's fighting huge wildfires right now i believe there's one in in uh, up near the navajo reservation near the grand canyon um and and i don't even know where else but i know there's more with the cost of the firefighting with the, the, the groundwater depletion, we have to, and, and the COVID-19, and, and the, the, the mitigation factors that we're going to have to put in place for education, we have to understand that the revenue and, and the budget impact, the state level is going to be significant. We don't know yet what it's going to be. We don't have the latest numbers. It's going to be significant. And, and I, I think what we're looking at is not all bad. I think it's, a, it, it's an opportunity to do things differently. So I just want us to all be aware and be looking around because we're only as good as you guys are. So, so feed us, feed us your, your knowledge and your wisdom around these things. And, and that's all I wanted to say. Okay, so we have a question about um, reducing the prison population. Um, now we have we have suggested that uh, to Governor Ducey that there are people who could get early release because of COVID nineteen, but so far we have not uh, gotten anywhere with him on that. I don't know. Do you have anything else to say about that, uh, Dr. Fries or Senator Steele? Uh, I think that's something that we have in the House. We have our Judiciary Committee members, um, uh, our Democratic members of that committee are really focused on criminal justice reform and um, COVID in our prison system. And they have been pushing for uh, early release, uh, compassionate release for um, those that are uh, um, 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 dying from illness. For some reason, my, my, my words are slipping me, but uh, there are plenty of prisoners that have cancer, that have um, um, terminal diseases that we are trying to get released. And then, you know, those that are in prison for nonviolent crime should also be mm -hmm. uh, considered for early release. So I, I think these are, as, as, the, as Mary mentioned, other states are doing it. We are talking to uh, the executive about that, and, as well as uh, uh, the uh, DOC um, director, things like that. So uh, the, our caucus has been pushing uh, for those changes, but um, nothing has happened just yet. Uh, I wanted to revisit real quick, Mary Strauss talked about personality tests and things for our officers. Uh, I think that's a very good point. The question that keeps coming back into my mind is what should a police department unit look like? We need more psychologists and social workers, and we need to be able to pull these officers off the streets if they're exhibiting some concerning behaviors for evaluation just like you would stop a pilot from flying a plane if they're exhibiting you know physical problems or vision problems but we need to make sure that we're screening and looking at these things and intervening and and helping these people get back to their job and be effective um, so yeah we, we've got to make sure that the the new departments include mental health evaluations of our officers so that we can intervene at the right time. So we have another question uh, from Lynn Hudson about um, coordinating used uh, notebooks or computers uh, to donate to schools and then also about uh, internet service providers donating access. Now, uh, I'm not sure about uh, the used computers, but I have heard talk about internet service providers donating access to the schools. Now, I'm not sure if that actually happened or not? I will tell you that, that I know on the reservations, the infrastructure for um, the internet, is just not there. It's not there. I mean, some, some places, in, in, particularly on the Navajo reservations, don't even have um, electricity. So I, I was on a, a call last night, a, a uh, um, a town hall with the uh, AFL-CIO, with Senator Jamesita Peshlika, she represents the Navajo uh, Nation area. And she was saying that she's spending a lot of time at her mom's house because her mom has electricity and running water, and she does not. 
And so there are a lot of places on our reservations that don't have these things that we take for granted. So when it comes to um, laptops, you know, I mean, a laptop is kind of useless. If you have no way to, to watch it. Well, they're interesting. That's a great question. And Victoria brings up, you know, the importance of our, 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 our infrastructure in our very rural areas. And unfortunately, you know, the budget didn't include everything in it uh, that was originally proposed. And one of the one of the really good ideas that the governor had was um, um, he was calling it our smart highways. So every time a highway is improved or extended, uh, he, he wished to um, include um, cable and, and you know for for internet access so one, one of the you know it's if a city is is very far north but you know it's up to that city to to build the infrastructure to connect to to the nearest um, um, place that it can get some some um, hard you know some cable some some connection but if we put it along every highway that's much shorter for them to need to get to so I, I thought that was a really good idea to start funding this concept of get the highways to have this you know, when you're putting in the roads, let's put in this cable that can be tapped into and, and make it cheaper for our rural cities. Another idea that I hope to uh, propose a grant project for would be for mobile hotspots. Let's just get a company money to send out little mobile hotspots for, you know, from 10 to 2 every day. I'm going to be in this area that doesn't have um, access or this area so that as our kids are staying home from school, they'll be able to access the internet when they're at home. So, you know, uh, as we're bridging ourselves to better infrastructure, we need to start thinking about ideas that temporize that. And I think this concept of sending out a van and they just go park somewhere and they now have, um, you know, a hotspot area that, you know, for part of the day, something like that. We have to start thinking outside the box. Sorry about that. I was, uh, people are trying to get in at the end with no name and I'm not letting anybody in without a name. Okay. <laughs> so, um, that's what happened last time. I, uh, I wanted to say that, um, so Cheryl had a question for somebody else and she was asking about, uh, um, where does the Democratic Caucus stand on SROs in schools and would uh, removing them be part of the efforts to reform law enforcement and what districts are considered competitive? So what about the SROs, um, you guys? Yeah, I mean, SROs, the, the, the discussion about SROs has uh, always been, you know, um, we would rather have more counselors in schools than, than more police officers in schools. Um, I think this is a time that I've seen across the country, uh, different school districts are starting to cut back on their SROs. Uh, you know, I, I think, again, I, I agree with um, what Pam was saying earlier about local control and what, what Superintendent Hoffman is doing. I, I, I wish to push the superintendent and the state board to um, mandate masks. Personally, I believe in a time of a pandemic, pandemic, local control could be set aside. And I think I would rather see more uniformity. So I am going to ask the superintendent to consider through the board uh, mandating masks. But, you know, um, as far as the SROs go, I, I do think that that's a local control issue. And I'm very glad to see that school boards are reevaluating their use of, of the SROs. I would rather them spend that money on counselors. I, I heartily, heartily agree. Um, I, I also wanted to say, and I really, the last time we got photo bombed or Zoom bombed, it was right about this time with this topic, but this is the perfect time for me to bring this up. Um, I have started a, what's called the Arizona Child Abuse Prevention Initiative. And we are working with a lot of different um, child advocacy groups and, and including the, the governor's Office of Youth, Faith and Families. And the, the thing is when children are home during a pandemic, child abuse does not stop. What we know is it gets worse. And so I will tell you that the numbers for child abuse, neglect, uh, abuse and neglect um, complaints or, or reports dropped immediately when children stayed home. And that's because we don't have eyes on those kids. And that doesn't mean they're not in danger, 
That just means that nurses and school counselors and teachers and bus drivers, they're not seeing them. They, they don't have their eyes on them. They don't know what's happening and they're trying. Um, so this, this group is, is working to, um, to make a, a public awareness campaign. So we have warm lines and we have hot lines throughout the state. We've got one in, in Pima County, then we've got one through Child Health, which is a national group but located and, and, and centralized here in Tucson in, area, in, in Arizona. Um, and we're also encouraging mandated reporters to call those um, Department of Child Safety, the DCS lines, and so they have to. But one thing is a lot of people aren't sure if what they're seeing rises to the level of child abuse. And they don't know, should I do this? Or am I just being nosy? Or that we're gonna get their kids taken away? Should I do? And then there's the other thing where children, if, if the children know that they can get on a, a, a chat room through child help or through the local warm line, they can go online, they can do a, a texting program with people. Um, on the other end of these warm lines, are um, trauma-informed people. They are experts that, that know how to handle it. If a child says, I think my daddy might be hurting my mommy, or I think my daddy might be hurting my sister or my brother, um, they, can, they can take action then. I will tell you that in our, we have calls every two weeks with, with people from all over the state on this um, alliance or this this um, initiative effort. It, it is a public awareness program or campaign, if you will. Um, the last time we met, we had some real somber faces as people told us, particularly here in Pima County, that what they feared was even worse than they feared because they are seeing um, reports at our emergency rooms and our hospitals of children. The, the cases of abuse that are now coming in have been going on and festering and getting much worse. And that the cases that they are seeing are absolutely, in their words, horrific. And um, our, our kids are not always safe. And so it, it's, it's really a, a big, thing of mine to, to work with, with people throughout this state um, to prevent childhood, child abuse and, and to respond to it when we find that it's happening. So this, this gives a, a lot of, I just wanted you to know about this program. It's a really great program and, and um, doesn't cost us anything. It's, there's no money involved. Um, and we've got a lot of people working to get the word out and and i'll stop there because there's so much more i could say about this but um it's i just wanted you to be aware of it and and that it is really one of my concerns and the fact that we had the zoom bombing on that topic the last time we did our our ld9 town hall that was that was really um that was very telling um and i'm, I'm again i'm so sorry that you were all traumatized um but it points out the reality of this problem. This, in fact, I, I will say child abuse, child trafficking, the, the trafficking, the selling of children's bodies for sex and, and porn and, and other things is, is the third most profitable, illicit industry, black market. Um, it's, it's only behind um, drug and arms trading. And the only thing is that makes it so profitable is you can only sell a drug or, or a gun maybe once or twice, but you can sell a child's body all day long. And that's happening. And it's happening under our nose. And um, there is, there's a really big, when we talked to the FBI about what happened, he said, we think this might be part of a, an international group. And they may not have been, a, you know, going after um, any one particular person or group, they were subject related. So when they know who's doing what on these subjects, they find you and then they, they try to get you to, to, they try to scare you to get you off the topic. So we're not scared, we're strong, we're tough, we're back and we're gonna fight 
whatever it takes to protect children, we're going to do. Um, especially me, but I know my, my, my two counterparts here are right with me. So uh, I just wanted to, to let you know that that was happening. So that's, that's all I had to say about that. Well, be before we sign off, I wanted to add something on that note, Victoria. That is one of the things that, um, that Kathy Hoffman brought up uh, the other day was that uh, at, during this time of you know COVID-19 and as the schools open up that that they are going to be the teachers and the and the administrators are going to be aware of the psychosocial issues of the children and not only looking for abuse but maybe looking for depression and suicidal ideation and things like that so it's on their radar to to watch these children and so thanks for the reminder um, it's just a couple minutes before uh, five and um, I got a little reminder from a bird on the, uh, on the uh, chat who remained nameless, but if you want to encourage Doug Ducey to make everybody sign up to uh, make everybody wear masks, uh, Cheryl Cage has a Facebook page where she's trying to get people to mask up Arizona. And so I think that that's a good idea because we should be wearing uh, masks, um, you know, just because um, certain parts of the state think that they're invincible you know, I think we believe in science here in LD9, right? <laughs> and so uh, anyway, uh, I think that that's about it. It's, uh, you know, five o'clock, yeah. One more thing, again, I'll say it again. If you have not signed the Invest in Ed petition, please do so. I've got several, I will drive them to you wearing a mask and gloves if you want. So I will get, I'll get them to you, but contact me and let me know. Yeah, there's also that uh, that second chances uh, initiative about uh, earned release credits and things that the the uh, Friends uh, Service Committee is doing. They I think they gave up on trying to get the legislature to do something, so they're going to try a citizens initiative. So, yeah, there are citizens initiatives out there, and people are you know trying to get uh, safe signatures. And so, if you haven't signed, I encourage you to sign. So, um, I think that's all. Thanks for coming, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. We can't wait to see you in person. Right, right. <laughs>